first hand, you know. <laughs> Here's privilege to say they have our Pastor Josh to deliver our lesson. Thank you. Yeah. you know, there is one off Main Street where Bob <laughs> Lewis used to play. <laughs> Not saying I've been. <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, I was, you all have an email saying that I was going to talk about the book of Revelation, but uh grandpa died and i was traveling and and was was doing some reading and just decided because i was interested in what i was reading you know uh, robert frost said no tears in the writer no tears in the reader so no passion in the teacher no passion in, in the audience so uh, it's it's not scripture what i'm bringing to you today today is more philosophy and thinking about what's going on in our culture and trying to take a you know, get up in the plane as I was at 35,000 feet and sort of seeing the forest for the trees and wondering about what's, what's going on in our culture and what are the shifts happening within religion and the way that people think. Um, a lot of the time we operate on the level of symptoms of the symptoms of what's going on, but I think we we'll want to dig a little deeper. To get there, I want to tell you a story really a, a fable or a parable about two fish who meet each other in the stream. And one fish says, the other fish says, man, it, it sure is a nice day for a swim in this water. And the other fish screams and says, what's water? <laughs> we human beings tend to think that we're just individuals sort of roaming about in the world. But the truth is that we are always swimming in some kind of stream. And the question is whether we recognize the stream that we're swimming in. This has been true for all humankind in all ages. Culture impacts us as individuals. And culture also impacts the way that religion is practiced. That's one of the reasons why denominations exist at all. Denominations weren't the gift that God gave when in the Garden of Eden. They are cultural products, right? We worship and think about God in different ways. So today, I want to talk about the waters of modern times that we're swimming in. And I'm going to erase this wonderful quote from Bob Harris, but I love it. Hope it's guaranteed. <laughs> Results not guaranteed. I love it. <laughs> um, so I want to start by talking about this term, secular. Now, you've, you've probably heard this term before. Maybe you've used it. We often use the word secular. Uh, in, in concert with the word sacred. And we've, we've sort of separated sacred and secular. So in the 90s, especially, people started talking a lot about secular music. Um, and that's one usage for it, but I want to give you a, sort of a different frame. So a lot of what I'm saying today comes from a Canadian Christian and theologian and philosopher. His name's Charles Taylor, and a Harvard guy who has written a book called The Secular Age. And the book isn't just about non-Christians. The book is about how is it that we have come to an age where with each generation and each decade, religiosity is declining more and more and more. And really since the 60s in the United States, that's actually when religious decline, especially within the main line, started. Now, that may feel confusing to some because I know, for example, this church experienced some of its biggest growth in the 80s and in the 90s. But if you take the kind of big picture step back, since the 60s, the mainline denomination has been declining. And, and that's in part because after World War II, in the 40s and 50s, the slogan of America was, we were all in this together, right? The slogan, you picture that soldier hoisting up the flag at Iwo Jima, this gathering image of people together and, and the image for our days now is probably the selfie the iphone it's the image it's the image of the individual and it's interesting to me that one of the companies with the biggest market evaluation you may have seen that apple is at three trillion dollars which is greater than the gdp of the united states in the 1910s one company and their sole, one of their most important products, right, is the I phone, the individual phone. So let's take that back. Secular one is when the state and the church separate, okay? 
So this is something that's pretty easy for us because in the Revolutionary War, we were fighting to separate from the state and to have freedom of religion. This type of secularity has been more challenging and maybe the death of Christianity in Europe because in Europe, the state and its religion are much more um, in relationship together, especially the Church of England being an example of that. So I'm going to call that secular one, okay? And this is one that has, has kind of been around in America since its beginning. We haven't had too many problems with secular one. Secular two, this is what I was just describing as the movement for folks to not believe that they need to in order to be American to be Christian, or the, the, the death of institutional Christianity as just a cultural given. If you just ask somebody on the street, do you go to church? The 40s and the 50s, 95% would have said yes since the 60s. The percentage who would say yes to that have gone down and down and down. Now, some would argue that that's because it's those who were coming to church in the 40s and 50s who just went because they kind of thought to be alive in culture, I have to stop going. And so that, that thinning out was just leaving the faithful remnant. That's one interesting argument. That may be the case. But secular too really is, it's, it's less institutional Christianity, okay? And the fears and anxieties that come from secular too are the things that we hear and talk about all the day. Decrease in numbers, decrease in church budgets. Why are people, why do my grandkids, are, why are my grandkids less and less interested in church? Why? is why aren't there more young people in every man's Bible class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of the time, the church spends a lot of its energy thinking about this one, about, about secular too. How can we grow the church? How can we expand the church? How can we reverse the trend that's been here since the 60s um, of, of decline in religiosity in the United States? So that, that's secular too. Secular one, the division between the state and the church um, we were okay with that in the United States. Secular two has caused us a lot of fear. And the other question that I would pose is when you introduce a global pandemic into secular two, is it the case that the effects of secular two, less and less people involving themselves in institutions and institutional Christianity, did the pandemic speed up that process so that the, the kinds of religious participation we're seeing now are maybe what we would have seen in 15 years. But because of the pandemic, that process accelerated in some way. And I'm not saying that's the case, but that's just something I wonder. Um, if you wanna see what secular two could look like in the South in 20 years, go to the Northwest. I have a friend, if, if I go on the, uh, I call it the, the Presbyterian pastor dating website, but it's a website where you go on and you can and you, you figure out what churches are open that you could get a job at. Laura and I went on and we saw first president. We had an online dating process with First Presbyterian. And uh, if you go to, to Seattle, for example, where I went to college, there will be maybe one job in that city, right? Wow. Um, okay. One That's job. secular too. Now, you know, all of Seattle. This is the third one. So secular too, as I said, is where we spend a lot of our our fear and energy in the church. This is where we get people who make the combo. If we just, if we could just figure out the silver bullet magic program that we could offer Salisbury, the people would come back and, and secular two would be solved and we would reverse this cultural trend. But these trends are much more, I think, like tectonic plates shifting. And when you feel the shape, when you feel one shift, what happens? You feel the quake, right? You feel the quake in society. So we've been feeling this for a long time, but this is the one that I am most concerned about, okay? Secular three. Secular three, I'm gonna put it in really stark terms. This is really a phrase from Frederick Nietzsche, who was a philosopher in the 20th century, the death of God. Now, we don't obviously believe that God is dead, we believe God is raised. But secular three is the idea within culture that there is nothing transcendent. There is nothing beyond me in the world. Everything that I can know about truth and meaning in the world is something that I experience with my senses. And that's called the 
imminent frame, whatever is imminently next to me, in front of me that I can touch, or the scientific word for this is empiricism, right? Whatever I can touch, feel, taste, smell, hear, that is real. But anything beyond that, anything that I can't prove, anything that you can't tell me is exactly true and, and provide me the right data sheet for it, that's, that's false. That can't be true. What happens when people stop believing in something beyond themselves that they cannot see is rather than a community of faith who calls it sovereign, transcendent God who acts in the world as Lord, the individual becomes Lord. So the real issue with secular three is that the individual becomes the locus and center and nucleus of everything in society, okay? And what happens with that is the way in which people move about in the world, this, is, this may feel untrue to y'all in your, your generation, and I'm sure it does. This is more and more true for our generation, and then it's even more and more true for iGen or Gen Z or the Zoomers, whatever generational reference you want to give them. All of life as an individual becomes about curating the self. What I mean by that is my entire worldview within this secular three paradigm, since transcendence doesn't exist, is to just care about how I am perceived in the world and how I experience the world, how I interact and pleasure the world. And everything is at my own whim, my own desire. So within this framework, it makes complete sense that you can you sleep with whoever you want. You do, you do whatever you want, claim whatever you want to claim, because you don't have a large scale community of truth who is calling your actions into question. It's just all simply about you as an individual. So think of technology and social media with this. OK, so this was already gonna happen without technology and social media. But you can see, right, what happens when you combine a cultural idea that transcendence, something beyond me may not exist. Let me give you a really early, early example of this. Um, Thomas Jefferson, uh, and this, this was really before this was birthed, but, but the idea was sort of brimming. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a Bible and in that Bible, he took a scissors and he cut out all of the stories in the Gospels where there was anything that could not be proven by scientific theory. So all of the miracles gone, like Jesus' wedding at Cana, you know, unless you want to do as some have done and say that Jesus pulled some magical hijinks to reduce that amount of wine, gone. The uh, resurrection, gone. The healing of the, of the sick, gone. So Thomas's Bible was quite a, read quite a bit differently, right? And, and he could do that only because there was a worldview where anything miraculous beyond our sensing life could not exist. Maybe another way to explain this is the way that we do Santa Claus with our children. I, I've thought about this with Joanna. One of the things I prize most about a child is not their innocence, though their innocence is significant, but it's not their innocence that's significant about children. It's their wonder. They live in a world that is bursting with color and feeling and touch and sound in a way that if you just watch a child interact with a guitar, or as I put a record on in the mornings, Joanna loves music, the way that she, it's, it's like she's raptured by life. But at, at a certain moment, we ask people to put Santa Claus away and you come of age when you stop believing in those kind of fairy tales. Now, I don't really believe Santa Claus ultimately exists, but my point you're, you're hearing is that the death of transcendence is sort of a, a coming of age for us. So I was talking about social media, Instagram, TikTok, all of these things. Some of the people who are now becoming the wealthiest in Millennial generation, but especially in Gen Z, are uh, influencers. Have you all heard this term before? Social media influencer is someone who simply just 
shows what they're doing online and millions upon millions of people watch these. I saw on Netflix, there's a show that just came out. Laura and I watched the first episode with fear and trepidation, but we're like, we got to watch this because this feels like a cultural phenomenon right here. It's a group of 20 somethings who have purchased a, a mansion in LA and all of them are social media influencer millionaires. And all they do all day long is think of different crazy things to do so that people online can watch them and they can make their millions. And you see the despair that grows in some of them as they contemplate losing viewership. That, that is, in a nutshell, what secular three, the death of transcendence, can do with an individual. There's a few, uh, I'm looking for this um, data, here it is. This just gives you an example of, of how technology has sped up. Um, there was a theorist, a computational theorist in the early 20th century who who predicted that at a certain point, computers will be able or technology will be able to double its speed every 18 months. This was his prediction. And the prediction has come true. In the invention of the radio to 50 million listeners, so from the invention of the radio to 50 million listeners, it took 38 years, okay? From the invention of the television to 50 million viewers, it took 13 years. <clears throat> From the invention of the internet to its 15 million connection took four years. You feel the speed, right? Imagine what happens. We're, we're only at the beginning of understanding how this is affecting brains psychologically, neurologically. And it will be, I, I hesitate to use the word interesting because I think in some ways it might be devastating. The the phrase that Taylor gives for this secular three is he calls it the age of authenticity. This is where you get, you know, even think of commercials, which seem to be suggesting do away with the old, all of that old school stuff, all of that ancient stuff. We got to be new. We got to be innovative. We got to be authentic. Whatever is authentic and individually you is the most real, is the most true, is the most meaningful. Age of authenticity. Now you can see what happens when you when you pair the age of authenticity to a church that's existed for 2,000 years that exists on the roots of 2,000 years of tradition and theology that has as its living and breathing life force a book that was written over the course of 4,000 years and is as old as 2,000 years. And you introduce this 2,000-year-old living and breathing tradition that's all about a community of truth coming together and it's not about being authentic, but it's about self-sacrifice. It's not about the individual as much as it is about the communal. And what happens is a clash. What happens is a clash. And the church starts speaking a language that many of my youth don't understand. Or at least they're not built to. They haven't been raised to. They're not alive in a world where it, where it makes sense to just go to church on every Sunday morning. And folks like us, who've been given a lot of life in the church, say, well, I just don't understand why these young people just sit at home playing Nintendo instead of coming to church. But the truth is, that world makes the most sense to them. So the church has kind of one of two options. We either give in to the age of authenticity and start to sell church in a way that is requisite with this age. And you, this in part, not fully, is gave rise to contemporary worship music. Now, I'm not critiquing contemporary worship music. It's a cultural product, just like ancient hymns are cultural products. Um, I myself, when I was a young person, found a lot of life and connection with contemporary worship music. But in the 90s and the early 2000s, as was the case with this church, a lot of churches formed contemporary worship music services because it was felt that if we're not to be relevant to this age of authenticity where someone comes in as an individual and wants to have their coffee like they can in the coffee shop, wants to wear what they can wear, sit where they sit, hear songs, 
about an individual before God, if, if we don't find a way inside of this bubble of the age of authenticity, we're going to lose them forever. And in some ways, I don't disagree with the move. It's just a given that it, that it is a reaction to culture in some way. Taylor has this line that's really stark. He says, um, if, the, if the high priest of early modernity, so 18th century, 19th century, and early 20th century, was the pastor, the high priest of today is Silicon Valley. Let that sink in just for a second. To give another just bit of data, um, today, 42% of people trust pastors at all, just blanketly trust them, which means 58% of people just don't. Who would you assume is at the top of the most trustworthy vocation? What would you guess in our country? Not lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> not lawyers. <laughs> it's not it's not bankers because one of the movements that happens with with this is that it's not only it's not only it's not only religion as an institution that becomes questionable but young people are incredulous towards all large scale institutions and, and and no longer have trust in them so that's economic institutions that's religious institutions nurses not doctors not surgeons nurses in part because their role is sort of distinguishable from the institution of medicine. Their job is just to show up and to love and to care. Police officers, pharmacists, firefighters are all higher up on the list than pastors. And, and that percentage of trust in pastors is, is uh, well, it's taking a deep dive. It's going down. That's less true, by the way, of Salisbury in some ways. But I would argue that even if that feels less true of Salisbury, it, within 10 years, if you took a poll right now of people's trustworthiness of me, 10 years from now, that, that number would have gone down. And, and not just in younger generations, probably in every generation. Because while it's true that millennials and Gen Z, their religiosity is decreasing at a rate higher than every other generation, all the others are still decreasing, just at less of a rapid rate. One of the things that Taylor argues that is really interesting is that if you want to know about what's going on within a culture and deep cultural changes, you have to look at the mental illnesses that are at the top of the charts, the most heavily diagnosed. So let me give you an example of this. In what's called early modernity, the 18th and 19th centuries, where privacy, a polished demeanor, no matter what life throws your way, you are stoic in the midst of pain and suffering. What mental illness would you guess was diagnosed most at that time? Schizophrenia, it's a good guess. It's depression. Not depression. It's actually one that's not really diagnosed anymore. Hysteria. <laughs> Hysteria. And that this was this was not just a word you didn't just call some of their being hysterical which is the way that we use it now hysteria was an official medical diagnosis and it was for people who in the midst of having to live in a world that in you know, 18th and 19th centuries it was a lot harder to live than it is now there was a lot of war there was a lot of suffering there was a lot of death and people were were losing children the birth rates were terrible and yet people were supposed to be stoic and private and hold a good and polished demeanor and people would have fits of screaming in public and would sort of literally lose their minds and it was diagnosed as as hysteria lee is, is anybody going to be diagnosed with hysteria in the hospital anymore uh, i haven't heard that term okay before. yeah yeah okay carolina fan <laughs> <laughs> that's fair <laughs> Any guess what is any guess what is the most highly diagnosed mental illness today? There's there's really two. Depression. Depression. And what else is anxiety. one? Of them? Depression and anxiety. Depression was not really in the medical literature in 18th, 19th century. I mean, there are people that were born with chemical imbalances, but there wasn't a widespread cultural phenomenon. This is a really modern ailment, as is anxiety. And in fact, 
I learned recently that of all of the developed nations in the world, the only one that has anxiety as its number one uh, mental illness is actually the United States. So while depression is, is a big one here, also there's something about the way that our culture works that is producing more anxious people than anywhere else in the world. Now, many of us would think, well, depression is what happens when someone just isn't happy, right? Depression is the opposite of happiness. But what happens when you take away anything that's transcendent and beyond yourself, and the whole world now is just about you as an individual who has to be authentic all the time, which we all know is extremely impossible, who has to be your own true self all the time, who has to claim your own truth and reason and meaning and happiness in the world, what happens is you literally get tired of being yourself. There's a philosopher who has this term, it's called the fatigue of being yourself. And I see it in our young people all of the time. More of them are, are depressed and anxious. And they're more depressed and anxious than I was when I was their age. The sad end of some people's depression is suicide. A very sad act. But in, some, in one way, you could think about suicide as a decision and a devastating conclusion to saying, I cannot live in this age of authenticity any longer where I am the only person responsible for my own happiness and truth. There's nothing beyond me that calls me into hope or grace or goodness. And God is dead and meaning is lost. And the trajectory of that for one person, a long, a long course of life can be the little end of existence, the end of life. Another thing that happens when a culture moves into this age of authenticity is that its highest good, and this is in part because of technology, um, and this is in part because of social media, its highest good is speed, is speed. Now, let me explain. I've heard, well, I'll start with a quote from Shawshank Redemption, uh, one of my favorite movies. Red gets out of prison and he's been in prison for 50 years, right? And he says, the world went and got itself in a big day in prison, is what he says. Because it's, it's, like he's in a, it's like he's in a completely different world. And I hear people describing this all of the time. I hear myself describing it when the answer, what's the answer to the question, how are you these days? I'm fine, or it's been a crazy week. I'm busy. Oh, busy as ever. Life's moving fast. That's our, that's our answer. We feel literally like time has sped up. It, it feels like the, the world's moving faster. And for those of you who are retired, it may or may not feel that way. But I can tell you that for, for myself and for others my age, it feels like the world is, is moving at an, at an accelerated rate. One of the interesting things about the church in its first 16 centuries is that it was the keeper of time there weren't watches and there didn't need to be because one of the reasons why we established time zones in this country was because of the invention of the railroad you needed to know when a train that was going from washington dc was going to arrive in colorado was going to go to seattle so the moment that that new form of technology exists we needed to be able to keep time and through time now we've started to keep time on these watches but more than that, now we have watches that also are our phones that also keep time, that also text us, that we could also have email on, that we could also call somebody in Brazil on, that we could also purchase whatever item that suits our fancy. You see where I'm going with this. It's like culture has just sped up. The church with its bells and its sacred times was the keeper of time. And people in the first 16 centuries of Christianity literally believed that on Good Friday in the year 333 AD, they were closer in time to Jesus' crucifixion than those who were living 10 days after Jesus' crucifixion. Because the act of ritualizing and practicing that sacred time somehow connected them so intimately to that moment. They, that, that's how they believe time works. Now, that probably sounds odd and, and, and wild to us, moderns but people 
were kept in time by the church, by the church's seasons, by Advent and by Lent. And those seasons of Advent and Lent were supposed to orient people's experience of time in life by the life of Christ. What's happened now is it's time is being kept in a different way. An individual who's moving faster and faster through time, who's curating their own self more and more and more, feels like they have less time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, a theologian who was a German Lutheran pastor who taught in the United States at black seminaries and went back to Germany and was killed in a concentration camp with Jews because he was involved in the plot to assassinate Hitler, which was unsuccessful. And he said, time is the most precious gift we have. What do we do with our time? To be a modern person caught inside secular security is to feel like we don't have enough of it. We don't have enough of it. So I've given you a lot to chew on. And I just want to spend five minutes on, on the church and how I conceive and think of worship, actually, in the midst of this. Because it would be easy, and I see this all the time. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a group with, um, with Steve where we're, so, we're trying to figure out our, our committee structure right now. I'm in another group with a mission and finance group and a lot of groups that are thinking about how our church runs. And whenever those groups come together, what's always interesting to me is that many of us think that the solution to dealing with this declining religiosity is we just need to do more. We need to do more and we need to be faster and we need to offer more things that are more authentic and real. And so what we do is we invite busy people who are bound by not having enough time or living in the age of authenticity to come to our church, and when they get in our doors, we say, hey, busy people, we want you to do more and more and more. Now, what I'm not saying is that doing and acting as the body of Christ is a bad thing. My question is, what kinds of things do we want to be doing in an effort to stave off the effects of the death of God in, in culture? So rather than the church spending all of its time amassing more and more and moving faster and faster, how do we remind people that the God of the Bible, who is beyond us, who is and was and is to come, is alive and acting in the world. And that the imminent frame of our smell and taste and sight and hearing is not the only way, is not the only experience of the world. That you don't actually have to curate an authentic self because your most authentic self is in the person of Jesus Christ, in whom, says Paul, our lives are hidden in Jesus Christ. He is the true human being. If you want to figure out what is true and how to live your life as an individual, all you have to do is look to the truly human one, Jesus Christ. Or we can look to the Psalms that say, be still and know that I am God. In other words, in order to know God, there needs to be stillness. One pastor I read talked about entering into the worship space as entering into a womb. Leave a busy world, a busy and depressed and fast moving world. And for an hour, everything slows down. And you enter into a womb. And inside of that womb, you are given formation and growth and life. At the beginning, of that time in the womb is a call to worship, a call to attention, a call that this is not true, in fact, that there is a God beyond us who is alive and moving and acting in the world. This is one of the reasons why I think that Presbyterians, and I know Bob's going to be with me on this one, need to reclaim the language of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the living and active presence of God in the world. And you can tell how alive a church believes God is by how often they talk about the Spirit's presence in the world. This is why our first missional priority, by the way, is Spirit-centered discipleship. Because we believe that God is alive and acting in the world. God is not dead. Leave Jesus dead. 
Nietzsche's dead, that's right. <laughs> then you have a call to confession. What a ridiculous thing. What other place in your life does a community of people come together not to curate their own selves, to prove that human potential is unending, but rather to say, on my own, I am lost, I am broken. But with this community of faith grounded in forgiveness that cannot come from within myself, right? This is the other thing. If you're, if you're an individual in the age of authenticity, you cannot receive forgiveness because since you are your own God, the only way to go would be to forgive your own sin, I guess, which produces a huge amount of guilt because we know deep down we can't forgive our own sin. It has to come from outside, from somewhere else. Scripture and the Sermon, a book that was written over the course of thousands and thousands of years that is written in dead languages, is the source of comfort and hope and action. A script not of our own making, but a script of God's making, a living and inspired and spirit-breathed word. One of my favorite parts of the worship service is the silence after the, uh, after the prayer of confession. And I love to let it linger just a little too long. And I know when, when I'll, I'll usually say amen when I start to hear the rest of people rustling. Because we're moving through the world so fast that I worry that we just don't have time to listen to the voice of God. Right? When Elijah went to the mountaintop, God did not come in the thunder. He didn't come in the fire. He didn't come in raging winds. It would have made sense for God to come in those big and amazing ways. Right, That's the kind of church we want. We want the thunder church. We want the fire church. We want the raging wind church. God came in a whisper. And the Hebrew word there is actually a word that could be translated of the whisper that two lovers give one another in bed. A silent, intimate whisper. So in that small space of silence, that 10 seconds, I imagine, what, it, what are people realizing about themselves or hearing from God about themselves in that 10 seconds that they've just been moving way too fast to hear? And I always think it's in that time, what I do as the pastor is I confess and talk to God. And when I'm done, I assume people probably are too, but I have to give myself time for that. The offering, the belief that the world is not amassing resources for ourselves, but the giving of our lives to others. A conception that doesn't make much sense in the age of authenticity. At funerals, I was at my grandpa's funeral and I thought, I remember thinking before I went, man, I really don't have time. I mean, there's so much going on. I've got Joanna at home. I know I got to go. And I, I thought on the plane, if you can't slow down for death, then what can you slow down for? Right? And death, memorializing the dead, the rituals that we do of taking them from death and accompanying the saints into the, into the arms of God is a constant reminder for the church of slowing down and of the presence of God who is greater than death. Greater than death most important tenet of Christianity, God is greater than death. And I do worry that funeral practices are actually becoming less and less common. People are just doing the throw the ashes underneath the 18th green at Pebble Beach thing, which, you know, my dad would love to be buried underneath that green if I can make it possible. But those, those rituals that bring us outside of this age, that's what the church is in charge of, that nobody else is in charge of. We're not just any other civic organization. We, we are charged with combating an age, this, this age. And I really believe that the church is the, one of the last deals in town that is capable, maybe most capable, of confronting all of these societal ills. But we're not going to do it if our methods match the problem. That's, that's the real key. And lastly, uh, the benediction. Another one of my favorite parts of the service, you all know that when Laura and I came, the first Sunday we were here, this was not planned. I just said, extend your hands. 
and and you know everybody had t-rex arms is what i call them <laughs> and now what's interesting to me is I, I walk up and i look out and already like i, I remember very particularly certain people because we all know where people sit and whether they sing the hymns and which hymns they like to sing whether they feel comfortable with their hands out or not and you notice the changes as a pastor right and it's a very intimate thing though you really you can notice these patterns in people's lives and i can think of people in my head who started here who now are just here to receive a blessing a word from a place that you do not know a word beyond yourself a word of grace and mercy and forgiveness to energize you and the benediction is like it's like that moment when the team, you get into the team huddle and you say let's let's do this let's go out and live in the world something from beyond yourself that you cannot claim on your own that you give one of the last i'll end with this one of the last things moments i got with my grandfather we were in december home for christmas my grandpa was always a really good card player and um, so we were playing a game called setback. I got to be grandpa's partner. Um, and, and we just we shared a great time together. And as he was leaving, I had this really, really intense feeling that I had needed to pray for him and bless him. Because when somebody is at their end, one of the things that I do is I, I pray over them. I say the ironic blessing that the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, may the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace both now and forevermore, and sign their forehead with the cross as I do to children when I baptize them. And I knew that this was the last, I, I felt in my spirit that this was the last time I was going to see my grandfather. And so I said, Grandpa, can I bless you? And he took off his Michigan hat, which is a lot. <laughs> But it's like he knew. It was so interesting that he took off his. It's like he knew what I was going to do. And I looked him in the eyes and I blessed him. And I said, Thank you. And he left. It's a great way to end a relationship and to end a life together. Not a way of ending life that this sort of thing affords. <clears throat> but the church. Christian faith? Absolutely. Thank you.